even the ones I would most want to leave out. <laughs> I won't name names at this point. But when you look at that story of loaves and fish, and this is how I'd like to close this part, is that it is the way forward. And this is my poem that comes from this. It comes from the bus. And it goes like this. Loaves and fish. I always joked that the miracle of loaves and fish was sharing. The women always knew this. But in this moment of need and notoriety, I ache, tremble, almost weep at folks so hungry, so malnourished, faced with spiritual famine of epic proportions. My heart aches with their need. Apostle-like, I whine. What are we among so many? The consistent 2,000-year-old ever-new response is this. Blessed and broken, you are enough. I savor the blessed, cower at the broken, and pray to be enough. Thank you very much. for being uh, so blessed and bringing that blessing to us and thank you for uh, the brokenness that you are so present to and that you have brought into our midst. It's, a, it's a, just a gift to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. So I have some questions. Um, and we, uh, <laughs> Do I get grades? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so here's one to start us off. All right, good deal. This audience is obviously filled with women. Women, no offense to men, know how to get the job done. What do you suggest should be our marching orders if our faith informs our calling purpose, faith without good works is empty? How do we translate our faith into working for justice in our everyday life? Well, beats me. <laughs> the, the, the fact is, you know, we're one body. Okay, my, my, my experience is we're one body and everybody has to do her or his part. And the only way I know how to do that part is what I call listening deeply which is the contemplative piece of listening to where you're being nudged, to where you're being pushed, to where you're being dragged, and not be too willing to procrastinate. I mean, the thing is, is if you feel a nudge, do it, because we're part of this bigger body. The body needs it. Of course, I joke about what part of the body of Christ am I? I might be a gallstone in the body of Christ right now, but... <laughs> But, or a stomach acid, I mean, you know. But the fact is, the fact is that we're in this together. And if everyone does their piece, it will be whole and healed. It's when we resist doing our part that we're out of sync and we're off base. So listen deeply and then do it, damn it. That, that's, my, that's my advocacy message is the do it, damn it. I say that often. How has your image of God changed over the years? <gasps> we ask those kind of questions here a lot. Oh. 
Well, you know, in some ways it's changed. But can I tell you, can I tell you a story of, of what, um, let's see, okay. In Zen, often is, um, you have a little mantra. And so if my mantra for a very long time was uh, Cardinal Newman's lead kindly light, lead thou me on. The idea of following the light. Well, then what happened was, I found out there was no place to go. Because what I had this experience, okay, I did seven weeks of Zen. That's a, you get a little spacey doing that. And, but I had this experience of, of being in Tucson and saying to the mountains that I was gonna miss, I was gonna miss you, God. I mean, God in the mountains is so exquisitely beautiful. And I was gonna miss God in the mountains, but you're everywhere. And I, I put the emphasis on everywhere, location. And what happened was this like thunderclap. No, Simone, no. Ooh, I don't pay attention. Um, I am everywhere. And what I realize, well, the way I think of it now is God's the hum that holds us together all the time. God's the hum of the universe. God's the hum of all of us. God creates us at every single second. And I have no idea the totality, but I do know that God hums us and we cannot. God is closer to me than me. I mean, God, God is me. Well, I'm not God, that's for damn sure. So, the, but, but to know that God is the essence of all of us. How can we leave anybody out? Even Mitch McConnell. So from, from that image of hum, a next question. How do you maintain your fidelity in the face of the scandals of the church? I'm amazed when you reference bishops in many of your talks, and in parentheses, I ask this question as a suffering, practic practicing Catholic myself. Any practicing Catholic's gotta be suffering at this point. Um, but with a little bit of hope. I mean, I got a little bit of hope, uh, but then I had to deal with my fear of betrayal now. Um, it's really hard. It's really hard. But for me, I, I mean, it's, I think you can see that this, this spiritual journey is the deepest, deepest piece of me. And so it, for me, my faith tradition brought me this. So how could I turn my back on the deepest piece of me? So my image is this. Okay, the, the institutional church, there's so much more than the boys. So the institutional church is like this little boat, this little wooden boat, and it, you know, they think they're it, and they swagger on the deck. <laughs> but really, the, the story is that the boat's only a place for respite, and the whole call is to dive deep and to scuba dive, and to faith is all about being in the water. But sometimes we all need to rest. That rest has been betrayed, and that's what we have to atone for, repent for, weep for, cry. My church has not cried, and that's wrong. We've got to cry. But we also have to have conversion and be redeemed. And it's all about being human. And Jesus could do it, so I keep at it. But it's, it's, it's only this little ship that was really screwed up. But you can't get lost in God. I mean, getting lost in God can't be wrong. So it's way bigger than the little ship. Make any sense at all? I don't know. <laughs> Good thing we're not at a Catholic institution. In one sense of the word. In one sense of the word. It's capital C, not the word. So here's a great question. Dear Sister Simone, who is your favorite Catholic saint and why? And P.S. Thank you for all that you do for all of us. Oh, how sweet. My favorites, well, there's a whole bunch of them. The one that pops to my mind is our sister Sarah. She's not actually a saint yet, she's only blessed. And I thought it was a stupid thing for our sisters in Central Europe to work for her to be blessed because I just thought it was giving money to the Vatican and they made me mad. But um, Sarah, um, our sisters in Europe are credited with saving over a thousand Jewish refugees. And it is one of the biggest honors that I'm a member of this community that did such fabulous things. But Sarah herself um, ran the school for social workers and she um, 
had a residence, and in the residence, they hid Jewish families up, on the top, up in the top in the attic and stuff. And somebody turned her in. And the, uh, I forget what they call them, the black something or another, in uh, Hungary came and uh, took her. And she said, take me in lieu of them. And they did. And they took her down to the Danube and they shot her and threw her in the river. And we didn't, the sisters didn't know, uh, this is 1944, uh, December 28th, I think, 27th. Um, and we didn't know, or the sisters didn't know what happened to her body till the war crimes uh, trials in Nuremberg. And somebody testified about having shot her and that she had kneeled down to, and didn't, they wanted them, the, the people being shot to face the river, but she turned around and faced them, knelt down, made the sign of the cross and she was killed. And for me, her witness of generosity, of being willing to put herself ahead of others. And so here's me, my judgmental self, thinking, oh, it's a doofus thing for our sisters to give all this money to the Vatican so she could be blessed. Because we know she is. For me, it was obvious. But then you know what happened? And it's so humbling that at the mass for her beatification, or, yeah, beatification was in the square in Budapest and I got asked to represent my community um, in doing one of the readings and do you know the reading of the Sunday was from James faith without works is dead and to be able to proclaim luckily in English the the scripture that scripture to a square of 12,000 people who found in Sarah some hope and some witness in a time that had been so hard in Central Europe that both her witness in 1944, but her continued witness as a, another way forward where all are protected and welcome. I mean, it's such an honor to be a member of a community with her that it touches me deeply. Thank you for the question. Um, as a woman who is part of a community, uh, you wrestle with what we wrestle here with at Union across the board in this country is the declining membership uh, in both Protestant and Roman Catholic. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we've talked about that. This is not that. working. Yeah. No, okay, I, yes. no, no, what was the problem was you were looking at me. Okay. Um, that in your order, you face the same issues that we face here, that the Protestant and Catholic churches in this country, particularly mainline and progressive ones, face of declining numbers. How do you think about your role as someone who encourages uh, the next generation to, uh, to follow uh, uh, the life of commitment that, uh, that has been so important to you, or perhaps you don't? Well, I think, I think we can, um, okay, here's the deal. <laughs> this is where I'm, you know I'm a lawyer because I just got it all deep, deep, deep. Um, the, uh, we, I know, and I think we do. The Spirit gives us the gifts we need before we know we need them. That's my experience over and over and over and over and over. So in the 40s and 50s, the Spirit gave us the gift of a lot of women religious because we had this immigrant community, we had the population explosion after World War II, we had the need for all of this infrastructure, we had a need for a workforce. So we got a workforce. So here's my, here's my rather uh, wild idea. And I'm, I've been talking around about it in a few places, but see what you think. Okay, so that was 40s, 50s. We took that as normative because that's what we grew up in. Duh. But the problem is, is that the needs have changed. So uh, my theory is, if we look at not what we used to have or what we used to need, but look rather at what we're being given, maybe then we know the needs we're supposed to be responding to. Because look at who we are as women religious. Ah, oh, we're getting old. Can't do like we used to do. But you know what? We have deep spirituality. We have a sense of community. We can listen. And we've got the, the hunger for a deeper truth. A capacity to live community. Right? There's a bunch of us in here. Right? All right, girls. Okay. So, but then, oh, and, and we're having to wrestle with death and dying because our friends are dying. We're all really close to each other. But look what the needs of our country are. 
a hunger for spirituality, a hunger for somebody to listen, a deep, deep need for community. And Lord knows we need some way of talking realistically and with faith about death and dying. So when I look at the gifts that are being given and I look at the needs of our country, then I think, well, maybe the problem is, is we need to wake up as women religious and find other ways of welcoming people in to share this richness of what we've got. And it's that challenge, that invitation, it's that opportunity, I think, that then, I don't know, bushes burned on buses. Lord knows what could happen if that happened. But, it, but it's all trusting that we are one body, that God hums us at every moment, that we will not be left orphaned. All we have to do is just respond with our part when nudged. So that's my pitch. Share. Invite people in. Help people mourn. Cry with folks. Laugh with folks. But be a part of their lives because that's what I think this is about, is that folks are so tired of being alone. And I, what I call the unpatriotic lie that we're based in individualism as a nation. We are based in community. We are based in community. <laughs> Said she in an opinionated fashion. Yes, yes. <laughs> so um, this is a question from me. Uh, oh, you, okay. Your work and your words call to mind, but can't help but call to mind for me, um, the writings of, of Hildegard. Mm. Um, who for, Isn't it cool? And they made her a doctor of the church. I don't think they read a thing she oh, wrote. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, uh, Helen Hunt, a friend who is here, and I have been talking about Hildegard a lot and her attention to uh, the need for a disciplined life to be able to produce and create community um, and that it's not something that, that just happens because a mm. fire burns, but a discipline to it. Um, but that is something that's very hard to find in a world of individuals who function on a notion of freedom of choices. Um, so could you oh. talk some about spiritual discipline and its role as a political form of engagement? Mm, interesting, interesting. Uh, okay, Walter Brueggemann says, you know Walter Brueggemann, this is a fancy crowd, everybody knows Walter Brueggemann, um, says that the measure of how, the measure of your faith is how you Sabbath. Ooh, whoa, whoa. And for us activists, that's a tough one. So how you Sabbath is the challenge. I'm not very good. I flunk regularly. Um, but the one thing that I do as a regular discipline is my meditation practice. You just got to do it. And... When, when I was practicing law, you know, I practiced law for 18 years. Well, I, I would just do it like 10, 15 minutes a day. And then, then if I had a really hectic day, then I'd only do it 12 minutes, you know. I'd cut it down. I got to get to work. So two minutes was going to make a big difference. I don't know. But it was my anxiety about meditating. And um, Gerald May also says, uh, do you know Gerald May? Will and Spirit is Psychology of the Contemplative Life. It's fabulous. The nuns are nodding their heads. Um, but... Um, the, the amazing thing he says is that when you are not wanting to meditate, and, and you know this thing where we say, oh, wait, I should pray more. I really should pray more. I, I just, I'm just such a bad person. I really should. We just got through Lent. I should have prayed more during Lent. Well, what he says is there's a good reason that you're not praying more, is that your ego knows you have to change if you pray. And so rather than beating yourself up, building up resistance, he says, no, no, say, oh, you're right. It's going to be really scary, isn't it? It's going to be hard. You, you could have to change. That's a problem. And you know what happens for me when that happens? Then my resistance re it re reduces. And so the disciplined life, sometimes you think, yes, we will have the disciplined life, yeah. But the fact is, the fact is we've got to have something, some anchor for where our prayer practice is, 
especially for the times when it's not rich, when it's foggy, when you don't know what the heck's going on, and I don't hear a thing, and all I'm thinking about is what I'm going to do today, what I did yesterday, and this is called prayer. But it is, because it opens us up to something beyond our need. But we've got to do it regularly, otherwise you're not going to recognize the nudges when they come. I mean, if you don't know how to use a cell phone, did anybody see that thing where they're trying to teach Pope Benedict how to tweet? It was pretty funny. But it's like that. We know how to tweet because we do it all the time. Well, we also got to listen all the time. So we know how to do that. So, I don't know. Make sure you've got your prayer practice. Make sure you've got it daily. Make sure that it's a part of you. And pat yourself on the back and say it's scary and it's okay. One last question, another one that okay. uh, goes right there with Hildegard, and it's this. Um, the image that you ended with was very, very deeply sacramental, Eucharistic image. And at the heart of Roman Catholic spirituality is, is the Eucharist. Um, what part of that order, that moment, that ritual, for you and your work is most meaningful? Ooh. Depends on the day. But I think the one that touches me most is the greeting of peace. Where I, the, one of the places where I go to church in, in D.C., it's functional church. It's not, not great church. Functional church. But it's a Dominican place, and it's got everybody. The little smelly bag lady and the guy that slept on the steps and the folks that work in the buildings around but to give everyone the greeting of peace and to know we're in this together. And I know this bag lady looks forward to that moment because everybody will shake her hands, even if she has her little dirty white gloves on. But it, it's so dear because that is the communion where we come together and can recognize the Christ will receive. Thank you for being the passing can, of that piece here. Can I end with a poem? <laughs> oh, you found the poem. Uh, no, no, this isn't the one. Okay. Where's the other one? I, I have a poem. I have a poem to end with, and it's perfect for that. That because it's it's about it's called incarnation, and it was written our last night in Baghdad, and I won't tell you that whole story, but that this this is about the heart of the heart of it for me, and it's about all of us together. So it goes like this: incarnation. Got it. Let gratitude be the beat of our heart, pounding Baghdad rhythms, circulating memories, meaning of this journey. Let resolve flow in our veins, fueled by Basra's destitution, risking reflective action in a 15-second world. Let compassion be our hands, reaching to be with each other, all others to touch, Hold, heal this fractured world. Let wisdom be our feet, bringing us to the crying need, to friends or foe, to share this body's blood. Let love be our eyes, that we might see the beauty, see the dream, lurking in the shadows of despair and dread. And let community be our body warmth, radiating Arab energy, to welcome in the foreign stranger, even the ones who wage this war. And let us remember on drear distant days, we are a promised Christmas joy. We live as one this fragile, gifted life, for we are the body of God. Thank you very much.